Welcome to Aspects of Writing. I'm your host, James Kelly, and my guest panelist is Janet Corsi. Our guests for the show today are Tracy McDonald and Renee Mullen Masters. The topic of today's show is writing without letting obstacles interfere. But before we get to my guest, Jan and I would like to read a couple of interesting facts about two famous writers who faced their challenges and became published authors. And Jan, I'll let you start. Christy Brown was an Irish author, author, writer, and painter who had cerebral palsy and was able to write or type only with the toes of his one foot. His most recognized work is his autobiography, entitled My Left Foot. And that was also made into a movie with Daniel Day-Lewis. Oh, wow. I did not know that. Yeah. 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 I saw it. Wow. It's yeah. great. Yeah. Oh. And mine is American author, pol uh, political activist, and lecturer Helen Keller was the first deaf and blind person to earn a college degree. Helen wrote a total of 12 published books, including her spiritual autobiography, My Religion. And a lot of people didn't realize that she, she actually penned 12 books. No. And there was one book that she wrote that some people thought she plagiarized. And what they think happened was is that someone had read her that book sometime during her life, and subconsciously she altered it just a little bit so that when it came out they thought, oh, she plagiarized that. Uh -huh. And they accused her of that. But she swears she didn't, that, you know, and well, we don't know, you know. And sometimes, I can see that actually happening. Yeah. You know? We all do that. I know when I'm a writer, sometimes I'll write something and I'll think I'm so unique. <laughs> and then I'll find <laughs> out later on, no, somebody actually wrote about that before. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And she did most of this before computers. She must have done it with typewriters. Oh, yeah, she absolutely oh, did. Had yeah. Or yeah. I mean, it's just amazing to me. Yeah, and she did. Uh, actually, it was a very, um, I guess you'd say, our just process. She actually had to, by touch and feel, when she was still learning the, the I wouldn't say sign language because it wasn't sign language, but when, you know, whatever. Um, who was the lady who helped her with? Annie. Annie Sullivan. Yes, yeah, Annie, Annie Sullivan. Sullivan. They actually, uh, what's the word when, when someone actually takes what you do and then you dictate Trans it to them. Transcribed. Right, transcribed it for her. So, yeah, she wrote her books that way. So you can imagine how long it would have taken to write each one of those books. Really? Yeah. Well, I, I've seen, they, they use like a board that has like one dot and two dots and, and 15 dots and... and they actually have to touch those dots to make the words. I'm going to tell you something very unique, and I can't remember the author's name, but you can look it up and, and just by what I'm telling you. There was an author out there who actually wrote by blinking his eye. He was a quadriplegic, could not talk, and every literally someone would sit there and they would recite the alphabet until they came to the, the letter that wow. he needed for the word, and then he would blink to let them know that's the letter. Can you imagine? And he wow. wrote the entire book that way. You'd have to be a wow. great speller to do that. Right. Well, and the patience <laughs> that it would take uh, to be able to do that. So mm. that's why you can't, you know, there is no excuse. We can't let obstacles get in the way. If we want to do something, it's up to you. You should never let anything stop you from what you're doing. Yeah. So if you're just tuning in, you're listening to Aspects of Writing with me, your host, James Kelly, and my panelist is Janet Corsi. Our guest is Renee Mullen Masters and Tracy McDonald, and the topic of the show today is Writing Without Letting Obstacles Interfere. My panelists for today, Janice Corsi, please tell us a little bit about yourself and your book, The Secrets of Time. Well, I work a regular job right here in Las Vegas, and I love it, and uh, my book is about seeing the other side of the pancake, that we can't just assume when we listen to somebody or see somebody that that's all there is to know about them. We really do need to, to converse with them and uh, learn about them before we can decide. Really. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, because she, she always gives this synopsis, and I'm going to add <laughs> to this a little bit. Her book is actually based on, on a story about a grandfather clock that is, inherit, that is inherited by someone. It's passed down through the family over 100 yeah. years. And this clock has secrets because what's happened throughout time is every person who's owned that clock, there's a little panels within the back of the clock where they've put letters. Yeah. It's kind of like a time capsule. Only nobody tells the other that they've hidden these time ca capsules there yeah. until one day. And by the way, this is a clock that the, the, the main character in the story talks to. Just yes. like if you know you have a you talk to your animal or whatever, she talks to this clock. Right. And one day a panel opens and well, a letter in, falls out. In a, in a fit of anger, yeah. she hits the side of the clock 
uh, you know, and it opens a panel and the panel pops open and she sees all these letters and she realizes how many other people have made mistakes in their life that they now that the secrets of that, that family really yeah and and so that's where the secret of time all these years is hidden well and basically it's about her life and how she thinks it's horrible that everything's gone wrong in her life uh, with the family some, and the kids she's made, she made some, mistakes yeah and pitying herself only to find out that it's not something new in life. Right. This has gone. This goes on forever. It's right. gone on in the past. It'll go on forever. 147 years worth. Yeah. So that's kind of what your book's about. Yeah. It's called The Secrets of Time. All right. Our first guest is Tracy McDonald. Uh, Tracy writes on her website, a dream is a fragile thing. It is a wisp of smoke that appears as real as, a, uh, as flesh when you're just a child. Mine begin that way. A song, a story, poetry, and then I went blind. Today, my world is dreams, fantasy, and fiction, a much more beautiful place to live. At age 23, Tra Tracy lost her eyesight. She is the author of Behind Our Eyes, A Second Look. Tracy has also penned Killing Casanova, Burning Bridger, and the soon-to-be-released Soul of Stone, all three of the genre non-explicit romantic suspense, published by Crimson Romance, a division of Simon & Schuster. Mm. Her novels are about the healing true love stories Love brings to any life shattered by trauma if you believe in the power of love. Tracy lives in a cozy town north of Las Vegas, Nevada, uh, with the loves of her life, her husband, and her three sons. She finds peace and joy with her boys. They inspire and drive her and comfort her, making it possible for her to live her dream. Tracy, what else can you tell us about you? Well, the first thing that I should tell you is that I am not the only author of the Behind Our Eyes. Okay. There are 70 of us oh, who wow. are authors who are blind okay. who contribute to that anthology. Wow. Oh. So Behind Our Eyes is a group of blind or visually impaired authors. Some of us are completely blind. Some of us aren't. And we all have contributed to that particular work. It's got fabulous stories. It's got wonderful poetry. It's got essays. There's all kinds of interesting things. So your listeners should go and find a copy of it. You can find it on Amazon and other places like that. And it's all from visually impaired authors. Wow. So if you thought that Helen Keller was the only person who could <laughs> write and be blind, you'd find the truth right. in behind our eyes. Wow. Yeah, that is interesting. And it's interesting, though, that you went on to write um, romantic suspense. Um, what, what led you to that? How, how did you decide to write romantic suspense? I did not realize it at the time, but the very first romance novel that I read when I was a teenager and I could still see was a romantic suspense novel by an author. Her name was Dorothy Teddington, and she wrote a book called Jayhawk, and it was about a Native American boy who um, falls in love with a girl and is abused by his family because he's part Native American and they are white. I did not know at the time it was romantic suspense. To me, it was just the best romance I'd ever written as a little 15-year-old girl. Uh -huh. And I, I patterned much of what I wrote after the way I learned about wonderful romance Okay. from this particular book. Dorothy Keddington still writes, but she was the real inspiration for romantic suspense. I tell people all the time, I write romantic suspense. Just in case you want a little more action in your book than between the sheets. <laughs> uh huh. All right. How did you get together with those other seventy? Yeah, with behind your eyes. How did you find the other? How did you find out about this anthology? Um, I belong to a federation. We are called the National Federation of the Blind. There are fifteen thousand members of the National Federation of the Blind everywhere from New York City to the South and all the way across the United States. We meet together um, on a chapter basis. I have a chapter that's here in the little town that I'm from, uh -huh. but there are Utah chapters, there are New York chapters, there are Washington chapters, and then we all belong to the National Federation. And we are all a group of writers that when we find other people who are interested in writing, we get together and we do radio programs, and we have um, a page that we're all a part of, and we email back and forth, and we have a call that we do on um, Sundays that um, we share, we critique, we bounce ideas off of each other. A lot of it is about 
what blind people go through that other people can't understand. But a lot of it is just support for the dreams that we all want to live that we've been told for a long, long time that we can't because we can't see. Right. Uh You have a website, actually, that that deals with that as well. I do. What is that website? My website is tracymcdonaldauthor.com. And it's T-R-A-C-I. Yeah, this is what I tell people. It's Tracy with the extra I because I'm blind. (laughs) And (laughs) And McDonald like golden arches. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, we're Tracy related McDonald's. to the McDonald's only enough that we'd get five cents if we were to any, ever win any of the McDonald's <laughs> <laughs> lawsuits. Uh, and you know what's interesting, Tracy? I have another author who I'm going to be interviewing in March from Australia, who happens to also be blind. And what's interesting oh, is, yeah, she found me on the internet and she just emailed me and said, "Would you ever consider having me on the show?" And I said, "Well, of course." Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, maybe I'll have you back with her. We'll see. Oh, I'd love to talk to her. I, I'm i very interested in people mm-hmm. because I learn through my experiences with people. I am always interested in learning more about other countries and other places and other past because we are told to write what we know. Right. I can't pick up very much with my eyesight because I don't have any. Right. So I write what I know from other people. Right. So I'm always interested in learning more about other people. Do you have any other books you're working on? Um, The Soul of Stone is the first one in a series. Okay. So I am in the process of getting my second one in the series, which is called Heart of Ice, ready to go. And then the third one in that series has a rough draft that is written and it will be worked on next. Okay. Um, I'm also in the process of writing a series of memoirs. I have an interesting story as far as my life is concerned. I'll give you some details about my interesting life okay. <laughs> if we have time. All right. But, um, so, so, Tracy, how do, do you, how do you write? How do you actually do it? How do you do it? Um, I have what is called a um, screen reading program. Job assisted work skills. We call it JAWS. Uh huh. Oh, okay. What happens is, and, and I call him JAWS all the time, and I yell at him and I say, JAWS, stop talking to me. <laughs> <laughs> what happens is, my computer talks. Oh. So uh-huh. you see a screen, and you can go to what you want with your mouse mm-hmm. and um, click on it with your mouse, and then it will come up with what you're looking for. I use a keyboard to be able to go heading to heading, row to row, and pick out the things that I want off of the screen and then tap with my keyboard on certain things. There are shortcuts. There are things that you can do with your keyboard because a mouse won't work for me. And so Um, you you use a a regular keyboard, though, like anyone else would use? Okay. Yes, I use a regular keyboard. Um, When I very first learned to use the keyboard, I memorized the entire keyboard, and now my keyboard is so um, worn down from the (laughs) amount of writing that I do that I just know where the keys are. Uh I actually got a new computer last week, and I don't have the keys worn down, and I am lost (laughs) (laughs) while I'm trying to get the new keyboard figured out. Is that because it... Do you talk talk your stories to the computer and get it to write it, or do you type it? Well, this is one of the things um, I've had people suggest to me that I talk to the computer and have the computer write it. But the problem is I'm a writer. I uh, don't talk yeah. and be able to make my story do what I want it to do. I talk to myself a lot of times. I have a little handheld computer that will record my voice. So I will talk to myself. My kids will hear me muttering and wandering around the house <laughs> while I lay out dialogue or I set up a scene, or I put together a plot item from my book, and then I'll record that idea onto my little handheld recorder, and then I'll use those notes to remind me of what I was thinking or doing well, at the and time. I'm, but I, I need to write. I know what you mean, too, because as a writer, you're right. If you're talking something, because even when I've told a story into a, a, a handheld um, um, recorder, yeah. You know, I do that sometimes so I don't forget something. Like, I'll use my phone if I'm out somewhere. 
but it's yeah. not the same because when you're sitting in front of the typewriter and you're typing, you're thinking. So you're not exactly. talking to yourself, you're actually thinking. So from that perspective, it is entirely different. Yeah. And the emotional side of a story is something that's happening inside of you. Yeah. And it has to happen at the time that it's happening. Yeah. And I can't do that any other way but to sit and write what is happening inside yeah. of me yeah. at the time that it's happening. And it, I need to get it out through my hands and so, through the use of the keyboard. Do you set aside time to write or do you just tell the kids, I've got something, go away? Or what do you do? <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a little bit of both of that. <laughs> um, all of my children are teenagers. Yeah. So I get up early in the morning and I get everybody off to school, and then I have sections of my day. One of the things that blind people need to be in order to, for us to get along and do it, what we need to do is we're very organized and disciplined. It's the way we get around. It's the way we handle different things. It's the way we're flexible when things change around us and we're not used to it. They teach you a lot of times with blind people that you should never move furniture or move anything out of the way because blind people need everything to stay the same. That is not true. Oh. What we need is the opportunity to be able to be flexible. Yeah. And when we bump into something, go around it. Yeah. Uh -huh. So you we trip relearn. over yeah. something. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Life is about being flexible. Yeah. It is yeah. not going to be set up a certain way. Yeah. You have to learn how to flex and bend and change as the world does. And blind people are actually really good at that. We can trip over something and still be okay. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah. It is interesting how when we don't have one sense, the other senses become greater. I've had many, many people say to me, oh, your hearing is so good. It's not. I have the same hearing you do. Uh, I just well, rely on mine and you don't rely on yours. That's yeah. the only difference. Yeah, 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 right? yeah, yeah. Exactly. Right. Go ahead, mm -hmm. Renee. There was, um, they changed a light uh, in our town. And one day, uh, a blind guy that was used to t crossing the street in a specific way didn't realize the light and the crosswalk had been changed. So all th this guy standing in the middle of the street trying to figure out what's going on. And everybody in all the cars, we just froze we stopped yeah nobody said a word and finally he had his cane and he got himself across the the street and it was it was really uh, it was a beautiful dance it's a, it was like everybody was supporting him mm -hmm. and doing what he needed to do it was great it was really neat. that was that it's wonderful and it's kind of like what you just said tracy he had to learn and that he learned that day yeah yeah I'm a, I'm a big believer that you cannot lead unless first you follow. And yeah. you cannot teach unless first you learn. Yeah. And that's mm -hmm. what I've gotten from being blind. Yeah. If I want to lead, I must first follow. Yeah. And if I want to teach, I must first learn. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Jan, I'm going to let you introduce Renee. Wow. Uh, er, everything that you've just said is so inspirational. And our next guest is, Mo is uh, Renee Molin Masters. Renee has spent the past 25 years changing the lives of students nationally. She helps them learn how to use their brains the correct way for success. Following college graduation, Renee was a speech therapist uh, with the Fountain Valley School District. She then formed a private practice in Orange County, California. Now living in Ashland, Oregon, for over a decade, Renee took care of her husband, best friend, and partner who suffered from vascular dementia. When he passed away four years ago, he was of the mental capacity of a three-year-old. Once he passed on, Renee's life changed completely. Single again after 30 years of marriage, she decided to pursue her love of writing and complete her first novel, Peace Train. A screenplay has also been written, and a film is now in the works. In addition, Renee is the author of You Are Smarter Than You Think, which we've all decided we need to buy that book right now. Uh. <laughs> Using Your Brain the Way It Was Designed, The Missing Pieces to Success. In addition to writing books uh, and producing films, Renee is a regular guest on national radio shows talking about how to turn education around with one simple step. 
getting students to value learning over memorizing. Whether you learn from her books or films, the inspirational lessons are there for all of us. Renee, please tell us more about your work. Okay. Well, when I read Dr. Howard Gardner's research about 35 years ago where he was talking about how everybody learns differently, I felt like I had died and gone to heaven because all of a sudden I realized that I was brilliant and I had thought I was stupid. Ah. And what really was going on is that school emphasizes two skills that I had I wasn't good at, but it doesn't tell you that there's a whole bunch of other skills that you can use to 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 be successful in school and that you don't have to just focus on those two skills. Yeah. So I created this book, You're Smarter Than You Think, and it helped nursing students get through nursing, which has been a, a real, um, it's a tough course to get through, yes. that's all I can say. You have to know what you're, what you're you got to know the material. Yeah, you've got people's lives in your hands. Yeah, really. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, for sure. You have to. And, um, and my second, my, well, it's not really my second, it's probably, well, it's my first, my first novel is Peace Train. And, um, people said it's such a, it's so different than you're smarter than you think, but it really isn't. What I've always been about is inspiring greatness in people. And Peace Train does the same thing. It, it inspires, it gives possibility, it, um, it opens the door to do something different than what we've always done. And it allows us to and, look at ourselves differently. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, and so that's what I've always been about. And I'm right now about bringing love notes to the world. That's what I'm all about. And I've got about five novels that are just sitting behind waiting for me to sit down and write them out. Uh-huh. So what is love notes going to be about? Well, love notes are all like, Peace Train is my first love note, and then I've got, you know, about five more that I'm going to bring to the world. Okay. And, and it's, it's a, um, it's, 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 it's a love note. I'm bringing a love note to the, to the people. Well, I (laughs) have. That's what I'm doing. There's something that you, you had in your past that I can relate to in my life, and that is when your husband passed away, he was about the age three. Now, his was due to dementia. But speaking of love, I just want you to understand how effective that can be in one's life. My grandparents were married for 53 years. Everyone always thought, well, if my grandfather passes away, my grandmother will fall apart. And they thought, if my grandmother passes away first, my grandfather will be just fine because he always appeared to be this tough old guy. Well, it was just the opposite. My grandmother passed first. And from the day she died, he always thought she was still alive. And he eventually regressed back to where he was dating her when, when, as teenagers. So, and literally, that's what, he had gotten to the point in his life where he had no children, and he was dating my grandmother. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. it's amazing how love and the mind can do this to you. Yeah. Love is very powerful. It is, it's really interesting in this, uh, these friendship pods that are in this, in my new novel. Um, I, my experience is that when you do a friendship pod with somebody and you actually connect with them, there is a connection. And the, believe it or not, researchers in Israel have discovered that when you make a connection with another person, there is literally an energetic something that happens between the two people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's, it's actually a thing. <laughs> yeah, I believe that. I yeah. do too. I do too. Yeah. And I think it's love, but it's yeah. it's ener- it's an energy. Yeah. That's very powerful. As a, as a blind person, um I feel the energy that is created between people that I can't see and I can tell if something is happening between people and the emotion that's involved in that because it's a living breathing thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. As far as my other senses are concerned and you're right love is a powerful thing it's a creative process it's a and very when, uh, go ahead Renee. in my experience of when love is present 
everybody wins. It's like if you have two people, Democrats, Republicans, across from one another, if that love connection can get there, Mm -hmm. they can come up with a solution where everybody wins. Right. And it, I've, I've experienced it. Well, I have to tell you what was interesting about what, because I know dementia is one thing. Alzheimer's is also a form of dementia. Yeah. And w- he didn't have that. And that's what people need to understand. He did that to himself. Mm-hmm. And I went to stay with him when she died for the first two weeks after she died. And they had just sold their home and were, they were closing on their home. She died on Sunday. He had to close on that home on, on Wednesday. And they were going to travel the rest of their lives. They had three properties they had sold. And so anyway, when that happened because of his breakdown, he moved in. We moved him to a small apartment. And I stayed with him the first two weeks. And they had three homes they had taken pictures out of with grandkids and, you know, and, yeah. and paintings and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And every day he was on me, well, you have to get these pictures hung before mother gets home. Yeah. And I said, but. Grandpa, why are you saying that? You know she's not coming home. Oh, yes, she is. She'll be here in a little while. We have to get these pictures on the wall. So it wasn't dementia. It was something that he triggered in his mind that set him on that path. So it's almost like he couldn't accept that she was gone. Right. Right. Yeah. He never accepted it. And so he created this fantasy Mm -hmm. that he lived in. Right. And when she wasn't coming home anymore, he decided to regress to the point to where now he was dating her. So there was a reason for right. him to have to go and see her. He literally would drive to the town where he met her. He was dri- he would that's he had an accident going there. Wow. And actually, that's what almost ended his life. And he spent the last year in in a, in a retirement home. Um, wow. So yeah. So Renee, Amazing. tell me, uh, has writing changed your life? Well, yeah, it has. It surprised me, number one. But, yeah, it has changed my life. Um, You know, when I wrote um, You're Smarter Than You Think, it was like uh, suddenly realizing that I was smart and not stupid was (laughs) amazing. It was like a, whoa, how does this get? And then the truth is, when I wrote um, Peace Train, I realized that there were people in my life, family members actually, that I had pushed away because they were different. Yeah. And I, I realized that I, I needed not to do that anymore because that contributes to all the angst that we have in this world when we do that to one another. Yes. Yeah. Because, you know, if I do it, it, it spreads to everybody else. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and what you've been saying, both of you and Tracy, and that is the the saying, love conquers all. And I think with your granddad, mm-hmm. because that love was still there and so strong, that so was the time. Yeah. So love is, yeah. love does conquer all, and we need more mm-hmm. of it. Yeah. So what's up mm-hmm. next for you, Renee? What what you up? Tell us about the, the movie Peace Train. <laughs> oh, yeah. Tell well, us about that. <laughs> Well, it's it's happening, and it's it's. I'm having the most fun I've ever had. I had fun writing the Peace Train story and uh, script, and now um, I've got this great team of people, and we're putting this thing together. And we're talking to three people who have lots and lots of money, and um, one of them is going to give us seven million for the film. Wow! And or not give it to it, they're going to invest, invest in it. Yeah. And I see them as a part of what we're trying to do here. I saw a movie last night that was beautiful. It was it was engrossing. But when we got when I got out of that movie, I felt empty. It was a, an empty feeling, and I want to do films that that when people leave the theater, they're uplifted, they're They're joyful, they're inspired. Yeah. And, I mean, we need to do that for one another. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. And now's the time. This this is good timing. Well, I'm I'm going to read a a few passages here. And when when I read this, we're all going to talk about it. So Tracy, Renee, both just jump in wherever you feel necessary. Writing without letting obstacles interfere can have many meanings. Of course, there is the physical obstacles, but there is also emotional obstacles. Then there is the dream state. From here, we will be talking about each and how as writers, we often talk ourselves out of doing what we love, which is writing. 
So, Renee, have you ever felt stuck or been in a place where you felt you had obstacles in a way that might keep you from doing what you love to do? Now, yeah. you mentioned you mentioned the fact that you weren't didn't think you were as smart as you are. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I have. Since then, I have walked into walls, absolutely. And oh, honey, I do that all the time. <laughs> and I have, I know, and I've made crazy that is literally. I wanted to figure out. I wanted to figure out why I walk into walls. Why is it? And how do I get around them? And I have a thing called tab. And if tab is present, you won't walk into walls. Okay. And tab. The T stands for thought, and A stands for action, and B stands for beliefs. And if thoughts, actions, and beliefs are all lined up, you don't walk into walls. Yeah. Uh Huh. That's fascinating. I like that. And it's interesting, too, because I find that when, when I'm trying to figure out something or a solution to something, I think sometimes I overthink it and I try too hard. But the minute I let yeah. it go, it yeah. starts to come to me. It comes to me a, a lot easier than when I'm trying to push myself. Why? Why can't I figure out how to do this? You know, it's almost like it's almost like you have a point of view, um, and when you let it go, it's almost like when you let it go, then spirit can come in and actually help you to get this thing to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Tracy. Well, and we, sorry, we take our. We take our point of view and we narrow down the point of view of the rest of the world to our own. And then we start seeing through the things that other people are telling us. Yeah. You can't do this. This is way, this is beyond what people like you are capable of. Yeah. And for me, the physical obstacles that I had, and I've, I've been sick since I was eight years old. I was diagnosed with type one diabetes as an eight year old. Ugh. And so the physical obstacles that I started with as a a small child were not my greatest barriers because they told me they would be. And my personality is that if you tell me I can't do something, I'm going to go do it so I can prove (laughs) that you're wrong. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) We were just given a news release recently that the country of Nepal has banned blind people from climbing Mount Everest. I have... Zero desire to climb Mount Everest, <laughs> but they told me that I can't, and now I Uh-oh. want to. Now I want to more than anything else. Oh my I have, word! I have two busted knees. I'm an old lady who's had two <laughs> operations for. Tra- I have a transplanted pancreas and a transplanted um, kidney. I've got three kids and a husband, and I. I'd live in the Mojave Desert because I can't stand the cold. But you tell me I can't go. And you're going to go I'm do it. I'm telling you what. I'm going to go do it <laughs> just to prove to you that well, I can. Tracy, I can see it, and I can tell you right now, it's not worth it. <laughs> <laughs> just, just stay yeah, home. You might want to rethink that yeah. one. Yeah. You might want to rethink that. Yeah. It's not worth it. Uh, you already said you don't like cold. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, really. Well, so those, those physical barriers aren't my biggest my biggest problem, my biggest problems come from the emotional barriers within me. Yeah. You tell me I can't do something, that fierce, defiant part of me says, yes, I can. Whether well, it's good for me, whether it's wise, whether yeah. it's what will do me the very best isn't important. And I have to overcome those barriers. I, I think what sometimes. What are you doing and why? We place obstacles in our way. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. Renee, we spoke to you yesterday as well. Jen and I were talking to you yesterday. And we were talking about how, even with my show, you know, I, I almost let obstacles get in my way, thinking that because they had changed the format and I was booted out of one network, you know, one station, that that's the end of the show. And I'd really convinced myself of that. And then later on, when you, when you sit back and you think about why does it have to be the end of the show? You know, there are other ways of going about this. And we do that with everything in life. If I need to learn a new program, I'm thinking, this is too hard. I can't do this. I need to find someone to do it. And then eventually I say, you know what? Just sit down and learn it. You can do this. You can do this. And I think we often do that to ourselves. We place the obstacles there that really aren't there. 
Right. And and uh-huh. let me clarify something. You weren't booted off of a show. The, <laughs> the radio station <laughs> closed down well, uh, and you know, everybody but, got the boot. Well, I know. So I that's know, the difference. That. But you, <laughs> Well, and be careful about the messages that you give yourself, the words that you use to yeah. convince yourself that you have barriers. Yeah. Right. We were right. booted and, and, off of a show. Yep. That's a reflection uh-huh. of the way yep. you feel about it. It's That's not true. It's the actual it's truth. It's the T in tab, which is <laughs> there you go. Yeah. That and is true. Yeah. Our brains right. are like, uh, you know, they're <laughs> monkey minds, you know, that are throwing out these thoughts that stop us all the time. Okay, ladies, I well, got it. And, and you know. <laughs> so stop it. <laughs> Because of talking this is to what you, what happens when you get a group of women who are going to tell you what for? <laughs> and, and Tracy, after talking to Renee yesterday, see, I just started a new job on on uh, Monday, and I thought, or actually Wednesday, and I thought, oh my God, I have bit off more than I can chew. But after talking with Renee yesterday, uh, uh, this is my cup of tea. There I got you it. go. I got it. I got this. You can climb Mount Everest and you can die like sighted people. Well, <laughs> <laughs> what a way to go. Uh, Tracy, I want you to do this in your head, not in, not at Everest. All right, <laughs> ladies, I have something for both of you, and I'm just curious. Um, have dreams ever affected your writing, or, and if so, how? Ooh. Should we take turns? Sure. All right, Tracy, <laughs> why don't you answer they first? Yeah. I'm n- I don't remember my dreams very uh-oh, much, so uh-oh. go ahead. Dreams are actually really good tools for me because in my dreams, I see. Uh huh. I have visual memories. Wow. And so when I dream, I see. There mm-hmm. are times I will be driving in a car down the road, and I'm thinking to myself, why are you driving? You can't see. You're not supposed to drive. It's almost going to die. And then it'll cross my mind. Oh, you're dreaming. It's the only way you could do this right now. And then I'll pay attention. I'll pay attention to the story that I'm involved in and what's going on and what I see. And I'll take those memories back to my conscious world. And I can come up with fantastic settings and storylines because I saw them in my dreams. My brain can create things that my eyes can't. Uh-huh. I but rely Tracy, on my brain. But don't you, um, at least for me, when I'm creating, um, I see. It, it's like I see. Uh-huh. I, uh-huh. And don't you see when you're writing? I do. Yeah. Okay. I okay, see good. everything. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, my brain is more powerful than any of my other senses. And if I yeah. can create beautiful stories inside my head, I can make them alive yes. by telling them the right way. Yes, 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 yes. Ladies, I have and to tell you. And my dreams are fabulous for that. I have to tell you this story. I had a friend who, like Tracy, had gone blind. She was in her 30s. She had a five-year-old. And prior to her going blind, her mother and... She and her son, they used to always go to the balloon races. In Las uh, Vegas, we have a lot uh-huh. of balloon races, hot air balloon races. And they, I guess she had skipped a couple of years because of having, she went blind because of t- a tumor. And so they had been doing treatments on the tumor and stuff, but she was still blind. They, it didn't, she never regained her eyesight, by the mm-hmm. way. But anyway, so she, she kept the cane that was folded up, and she would keep it in her purse. Because when you're in familiar surroundings, she didn't need it. And when you're in an open field, she didn't really need it because her son had her hand all the time. Yeah. Well, there was this guy that they had known who had a balloon from a couple years prior. <laughs> and he goes up to her. She's standing by his car, and he says... I need you to get in, Carolyn, if you would, and can you please just back the uh, station wagon up so I can hook the trailer on? And she starts to tell him, well, really, I can't. He goes, well, I'm just asking you something very simple to do. All I need you to do is just put the car in reverse and back it up to the trailer. And she's going, but you don't understand. He goes, how hard is it for you to just back this trailer? So she got in the car. She puts the car in reverse, and she very slowly takes her foot off the gas, and then he's going, okay, a little bit more, you know, because she remembered how to drive. And she oh, just sure. she's listening to him, and, and he says, okay, back up. And he goes, okay, fine. And she puts the trailer hitch on there and locks it up. He comes up to the door. She gets out, and he goes, now see how hard was that? She opens her purse. 
She pulls out her cane and unfolds it and starts walking away. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Good for her. Wow. And then he great. learned that she was blind. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> so great. Uh, so there, there's an example of not letting an obstacle get in your way. There you go. There is nothing that should stand in your way but you. But I will tell you this, uh, a lot of my work comes from dreams, and the very first book that I published was called The Emblem, which was a government espionage, and that book came to me in a 12-hour dream, and this is how it worked. I was on vacation on, on January 9th of 1990 in Ormond Beach, Florida, and I went to sleep that night, and I started dreaming this, and I had my word processor. I didn't have a computer back then. They had word processors, and I took it with me on vacation. I got up in the middle, well, I got up after I started dreaming it typed in the first thing, and I forced myself to lay back down and go to sleep and start remembering it again. I woke up about a dozen times at night, and we'd go to the word processor and write the story in. I was so tired the next day, I get up, I'm walking along the beach, and now I thought I dreamed all that. And I said, did I dream that, or did I really put that in the word processor? When I got back to the room, I went to the word processor and pulled it up, and there was the complete outline for that novel. But the last thing I wrote was, if you publish this work, you will be successful in your other. And I often thought, I've never been, I'm not a famous author yet. I'm, I have a lot of works out there that haven't been published yet. Um, but I often thought, what did that really mean? And then someone reminded me, but James, you have your radio show. Yeah. That book led you to this show. So sometimes we overlook things or we try to over-examine things. Right. And and the simple message is there. We just want to pretend it's something else. It doesn't necessarily mean I'm going right. to be a successful author. What is that saying? Those who um, teach, those who can't learn teach. Right. Yeah. So that's me. But anyway, <laughs> so dreams are very those important. Those who can't do. Or those who can't do, do. Uh, teach. And so dreams those who are, can't do teach. Yeah. Those and dreams, who can't teach. My dreams. Do nothing. My dreams but really do. But you know do. what? This is. I want to throw this out. Okay. You may. You may cut me off, but <laughs> okay, we'll okay. Um, I think it's really important to take a look and say and see whether or not we have given up on dreams and settled. Yeah. And I, the reason I can say that is that I had. Okay. I had given up on a dream and settled because I had had success with "You're Smarter Than You Think." But um, what I really wanted to do, I didn't think I could do it. Ah. And I just want to say, don't give up on your dreams. Don't settle. Yeah, well, I haven't. I'm still, I have a novel getting ready to come out. So, no, I, I don't give up on okay. it. Okay. But my point was is that sometimes this was all in that one dream. And, you know, I often thought it meant that if that first book was successful, then the rest of anything I write would be successful. But that might not necessarily have been the message. Success doesn't always have to be about one specific thing. Yes, you have four million listeners. Yeah, well, two to four. Yeah. But anyway, the thing is, yeah. is that, um, you know, so <laughs> I, I pay attention to my dreams, and I actually create, Tracy, uh, and I, Renee, we talked about that. I actually do have a lot of books that I create from my dreams. Um, yeah. I, I make a point. That's cheating. No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care. But, yeah, I have the outline for a lot of books. I have at least 26 works that came from dreams that wow. I haven't finished up yet. So I, wow. have a I have a scene from my second book that um, I was stuck and I could not figure out how to kill off all the right characters and keep all the right characters alive. Mm -hmm. And I dreamed <laughs> the solution to that particular problem. And then wow. I went to write it, and the setting and the connotations and everything that I had in the dream didn't fit in to the story the way that, that I dreamed it. Mm -hmm. But because I had the idea of how to kill off the right characters and keep the right characters alive, I could change everything else. I could change the scene. I could change the setting. Right. I mm -hmm. could put other people in the room. I could even change the way the room looked, which is one of the fabulous things about being a writer, mm -hmm. there are barriers that the world gives us. There are not barriers in, in our mind. mind. You know, right. and w with the novel we were talking about, there were only three characters in that dream, by the way. And we always talk about, too, how you, you have character development and how that works. 
they actually, everyone in that book, all the characters in that book, surround those three characters. They were all created because of those three characters. So, yeah. you know, a dream isn't always, I mean, I did see it like a movie, and there probably were characters in that, in addition to those three, but you got to realize when you're sleeping in one night, you can't dream like a, a real movie. But the thing is, is that what helps is, is that then as you go along, then you can develop your characters. So I basically had the outline. It was a story. I did dream it. I mean, I didn't have every line written, obviously. It right. wasn't that way. But it just gave me the outline or the premise of the story. Yeah. And then from yeah. there, I was able to create the rest. Right. Yep. And I do that a lot. <laughs> I do it every chance I get. Yeah. <laughs> Well, how do you because think? Em- extra sleep too. How about emotions? Do you think emotions affect you as a writer? Either one of you, or both? Who wants to go first? Absolutely. They do. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> That's two absolutely. All right, Tracy. How does it? How do the emotions affect you? Um, I don't think that we can do anything creative without emotion. You cannot build something without the feelings that start the root of everything starts with a desire for something more take a seed a seed is planted in the ground it's buried underneath earth it's nourished and it's given time that it needs to be able to grow into something something beautiful something that's a weed something that's complete and total trash something that shades everybody else but all of it is contained within that seed Mm-hmm. That mm-hmm. seed has to have an emotion that it wants to be more than mm-hmm. something underneath the ground, covered in dirt and manure and maybe a little bit of water. It has to want things above and beyond being that seed. And it has to work. And it has to use that emotion as a place to start, that yeah. desire, that want. Mm-hmm. That's very good. Yeah. Renee, uh-huh. what's your take on this? Uh, um, there has to be an inspiration, and, I, and that's emotion. Mm-hmm. There has to be something, at least for me, I have to be in a tr- – there has to be this emotional trigger that starts this creative process. Mm-hmm. And it happened with You're Smarter Than You Think, and it happened with Peace Train. And it's like, and it is emotion. And as this thing moves through, I found, this surprised me, the characters, the main characters in my in my story, they're like real people yeah, to me. Yeah, me too. Yeah. I have an emotional connection with them. Yes. It's the emotions Amazing. of the characters that actually drive me when I'm writing. Yeah, I, I don't know. I think for me, it's bigger than that. Yeah. It's the something else that gets triggered. I um, actually see my characters as real. And, and some people think I'm wacko at times because I've told stories. I, when I tell Jan stories, for instance, sometimes you think I'm telling something about someone I really Somebody, know. Yeah. Or, you know, when I my first novel came out, I was very good about talking about that first novel when I would give a synopsis to someone. And I would sit there and tell them the story, and they would say to me, how did you know those people, or was that a soap opera? And I'd say, no, I created all that. <laughs> you know, they, th- they thought that they were real people, that I was talking about someone real. My first novel went into, the first store it was ever in was a bookstore chain in Atlanta, Georgia. And you're so proud of yourself when your first book goes into the store. So I went yeah. into the store to see where it was on the shelf. And, of course, I went to the fiction section for government espionage, and I couldn't find the book. I went to the counter, and I asked the young lady behind the counter, you know, do you have my, well, she didn't know who it was, and I didn't tell her. I said, do you have a book called The Emblem? And she said, why, yes. And I said, it's on the shelf? And she said, yes. And so I went to look. It was a small show chain. It wasn't like a huge chain. So I went to look again, and I didn't find it. I came back. I said, I couldn't find the book. She goes, well, it's right over there. And then she pointed to the true stories. (laughs) <laughs> and I said, why would it be there? And she goes, oh, I read it. It's a true story. <laughs> no, oh, no, it is not a true story. <laughs> so, I did, that, yeah, that that's happened with me. <laughs> yeah. I, I've been worried about it because, I, you know, people think it's real. Yeah, yeah. 
and yeah. but that's an that's really an accomplishment though if you can convince someone if it's that convincing that they believed it was a true story. I mean, yeah, to I me, never thought about that. Yeah, that's an honor. I really. At first, I thought this is ridiculous. I need to tell her. And then I thought, no, as long as she's telling people where it is, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> Not only that, but I've read it, and it's a true story. People are like, oh, word of mouth is better than anything else. Yeah, that's yeah, right. That's, that's right. good? Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. All right. So let me ask this. Do you learn to tune out the past? Um, I don't know how you want to handle that. I mean, is it necessary sometimes to tune out the past? When you I don't write? know what you're asking. Well, for example... Uh, Let's say, for instance, since it, I'm, I write government espionages as well, and I'm writing a story, and I know that there's something factual about the past that probably wouldn't happen in a story I'm writing because of what had happened in the past. Do I want to tune that out, or what I'm writing is, is the relevance in what I'm writing, and who, who cares if what the past says was true or false? That's called historical fiction, honey. You can do that. Yeah, so it is historical fiction. But for instance, I, in my government espionage, I wrote the story before we ever had the Gulf War. That's when I created it. We didn't even we weren't uh -huh. even in the Gulf War yet. And at that time, um, no one ever thought for a minute that we would be involved in the Middle East and that you know we would have things happen in, in the United States, like when when we had nine eleven. In a million years, I could never imagine no, that year. someone would come on U.S. soil and do the damage that they did. Yeah. So when I wrote my story, um, I didn't have that in mind. Now I'm going to go back and rewrite this. And I often wonder, should I really worry if 9-11 happened? Or should I stay true to the story that I wrote in the beginning? I mean, how will people perceive that? Can you weave it What's in? What's the purpose of rewriting the story? Because all those things had not happened when I wrote the original story. And people might not – people – when I wrote it, like I said, no, in my story I actually talked about terrorism and something that happened in the U.S. way before anything like that ever happened. And actually when the book came out, that was part of the problem. People said that will never happen in the United States. Yeah. And so, now it has. And now it has. But now it's actually happened greater than what even I could have imagined. So sometimes I wonder, you know, is it okay to tune out the past or do we need to to lay credence to it if we're writing something? Should we how accurate should we have to be? I think it depends on the purpose of the story. If your purpose for this story is to accurately portray what did happen instead of what you had happening the first time, then tuning out the past would deplete the purpose of writing the story. Yeah, but see, that mine is it's total fiction, so it wouldn't have anything to do with 9-11. Uh, I just, you know, and it would be easy for him to buy into it today for the simple fact that we had 9-11, but at the same time, I don't think it would have the same credence that it did then because of the fact what happens in mine is nothing compared to what happened with 9-11. So, you know, I, do we have to consider all that's what I'm saying, basically? Is that something we have to consider? I read a well, really I think like everything. Her, Sorry. Yeah. Go well, ahead. I was just thinking with me, um, with my book, um, I actually got hired a person, an uh, an authenticator, to come in and make sure that everything in the book was somewhat accurate. Uh huh. Um, culturally. Oh yeah. Um. Not that it would matter to people here in the United States because they don't know any of that stuff. Right. Okay. But if the book, you know, when the book sells like in a foreign country or in Israel, it would be nice if it was accurate, you know, yeah. if it had some accuracy to it. I guess. Well, and one, um, of the things, one of the things we're taught to do is to consider our audience. How many limiting ideas have we considered? put on who our audience is mm -hmm. yeah well, your audience you didn't figure would be in the united states well guess what from mr well here's a, mm -hmm. an example of what i'm talking about the ten commandments the movie obviously the ten commandments the movie is not realistic to what's depicted in the bible because it's a movie and they elaborate 
So people right. tune out what I consider the past because even though you may know that that wasn't exactly how it really went down, you're willing to tune it out for the sake of the story because you're just really interested in the story itself. You're still getting the same mm -hmm. message across, but they've elaborated on it. See, I think you hit on it. Story is king. Okay. Mm -hmm. It just is. It's king. Yep. And if you don't have a story that holds together, I don't care how accurate it is. Yep. It's, it's, it's like, it's it. It's it. The, the movie I saw last night, story was great. It was held together, but it left you empty. Uh -huh. doesn't matter. It was a good story. It was king. It held your attention. What happened afterwards, they didn't care about. Yeah. Mm. You know what? I hate to do this to everyone, but we are running out of time. <laughs> And so we're going to be down here to the last minute of the show. Tracy, I want to know what advice you'd give to someone who has a disability and thinks, you know, that have, that have put these obstacles in their way. What do they need to do to talk themselves out of it? Well, the first thing I think they need to do is to stop considering themselves having a disability. Okay. I am not disabled. Okay. You only wish you were as abled as I am. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Get used to the idea that you are a fabulous, fantastic person just the way you are. Yeah. That God intends for you to accomplish certain things and that you have everything you need to accomplish those things. Don't let fear, don't let doubt, and don't let naysayers tell you anything different. You can do anything you want. It's your wanting that matters. And Renee, what about for you? I, I think that anything is possible. And I think that um, if, if you don't believe that you can do it, if you think that you don't have, that you don't have what it takes, you won't do it. But if you can <clears throat> get yourself to a place where you can believe it, and you can achieve it. Yeah. All right. So, Tracy, real quick, where can we learn more about your work? Um, you can find me at tracymcdonaldauthor.com. Once again, the blind lady with the eye. <laughs> right. <laughs> Golden arches. All right. Just like that, and you spell it that way. Um, there is ways to um, join my blog. There are ways to sign up to my email list. You can go look at um, Amazon.com and find any of my books there. You can go look at Behind Our Eyes, and you can find different um, information about the blind people who write in the United States. You can go to the National Federation for the Blind and find out about blind people all across the United States. You can just email me, author at gmail.com, and I will answer everything I like to talk, and I like to write, and I'll okay. put it all together and write you back. All right, and Renee, real quick, where can we learn about your work? You can go to peacetrainmovie.com and find out about the film, and you can go to you are smarter than you think, um, dot com to find out for you, you are smarter than you think. You can go to Amazon, and all my books are there, um, and uh, yeah, my uh, online training is at my website. All right. Well, I would like to thank our guests, Renee Mullen Masters and Tracy McDonald, along with my uh, panelist, Janet Corsi. And to find links to the show, you can go to aspectsofwriting.com. There's links there for this show. And the archive shows are also there on the archive tab. There you will find links to the syndicated shows on iHeart, I iTunes, amfm247.com, Spreaker, Roku TV, and my YouTube channel. Um, we archive, again, like I said, we archive all our shows on aspectsofwriting.com. So until next week, this is your host, James Kelly, reminding you, if you can dream it, you can write it. Thank you so much, Renee, Tracy, and Jan. Fantastic. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs>